everyone and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 115, the Chris McAlpine Hockey Journey, part two, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Petlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we get into the octagon again, go a few more rounds with this former NHLer to hear the second phase of his hockey journey and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota, or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon, and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. I'm forgoing a long introduction, since I did that in part one of your hockey journey, Mr. McAlpine, so we're going to just jump right into it. All right, then. You grew up in Roseville, Minnesota, and climbed the youth hockey, or the youth sports ladder, where you ended up earning a Division I scholarship at the University of Minnesota, got drafted 137th overall by the New Jersey Devils in 1990, and side note, uh, football uh, for the longest time was the, the sport that you had the biggest passion for, and then all this stuff happened. Uh, You played in 289 NHL games over the span of 10 years, playing in three different leagues and for 12 different teams along the way, and won a Stanley Cup in 1995, which I believe was your first year as a professional, so we're going to get into that. Um, We got to the end of your uh, Gopher College hockey experience, and now it's time to hear about what happened next in your career. So if you don't mind, pick up at the point where you played your last college hockey game. What happens next on your journey? Did you sign with New Jersey at the end of the season? What happened next? What happened next was we we lost out in the final four my senior year. Uh, we lost to uh, Boston University at uh, the St. Paul Civic Center, unfortunately. Uh, but for us, it was a great year. And then uh, I got a phone call from my agent just saying, hey, be patient. We'll see what happens. And... You know, uh, the guys were already getting ready. Uh, some of my teammates were already signing uh, right after the, you know, like the next day or two uh, and, and heading off. And a lot of them were going to the American League to, to go play, uh, get some games in. And I was uh, I ended up waiting almost all summer uh, before I signed. And I ended up signing, uh, agreeing on a deal through my agent two days, a day or actually, I think it was two days before training camp started. So why didn't you sign right away? What, what was going on there? I mean, uh, so were you hopeful for that to to happen? I was hopeful. I wanted to to sign right away because I just, you know, I I wanted to play. I wanted to keep going. Um, You know, I'd always, that year I kind of, you know, New Jersey, I never really followed New Jersey, even though I was drafted by them, which was, kind of funny, <laughs> you know, and then my last couple of years, it was kind of in college where I felt like I had a chance to, to, to turn pro um, and that it could be maybe a reality. That's when I started kind of follow them. And obviously they had lost out or that, that year they, they were in the playoffs or coming into the playoffs. And they obviously, um, they had a great year. You know, they, they ended up losing eventually to the New York Rangers in 94 um, in the, I, I think, the conference final to go to the Stanley Cup. You know, the great Mato goal. Oh, yeah, that's the year. So that's when I started watching it. And obviously, Benny, uh, former teammate of mine and yours, uh, and my partner with work, uh, Benny Hankinson, was on the team. And I remember watching him. He scored a big goal in the playoffs uh, versus when New Jersey was playing. Boston 
And so I was excited to, you know, I wanted to. And then my agent had told me, he just said, hey, I haven't heard anything and nothing's really come up. Then they did make an offer probably in June and it was nothing uh, that, uh, you know, according to my agent, he was like, no, I don't even think he told me what the offer was. <laughs> and he just said, no, you're just, just hold on. And he, he had told me early on how it was going to be. Uh, Lou Lamarilla was the GM and now it's GM of the Islanders. And just, you know, he said he's tough to deal with and it's going to take a long time. So I kind of, you know, that that's, and it's exactly what happened. Then all of a sudden I was getting nervous. I was getting phone calls from um, Frank Saratori, who was coaching a, a local IHL team, uh, the Minnesota Moose telling me I should come play there <laughs> and not sign with New Jersey. And that's when it got a little bit confusing for me and a little like wasn't sure what was really going on. And then eventually Jeff Solomon called me, uh, believe it or not, at my girlfriend's house, who is now my wife, um, and picked up the phone and he said, hey, we agreed to a deal. <laughs> then he, you know, I didn't even agree to it yet. He had already agreed to it because it was a good deal. And I said, okay, what do we got to do? And he says, yeah, you got a flight. And I think it was like three or four hours. And so I packed up and went out to uh, New Jersey and flew there. And then uh, we had to do physicals. I got got off the plane, um, drove to, it was the, this little hotel called the Turtle Brook Inn in West Orange, New Jersey which was just <laughs> not super impressive. <laughs> but we walked in and uh, there was a message at the desk that I needed to contact Lou Lamarillo. And so I called him and he just said, yeah, congrats, welcome. And you got physicals at 6 a.m. And so then it just was there. And it, But it was nice for me because Benny Hankinson was there Um a lot of college guys, you know, New Jersey had, you know, drafted a lot of college guys. A lot of guys I didn't really know, but I played against like, a, you know, Jimmy Dowd, uh, Bill Guerin, um, those type of guys, uh, Scott Pellerin. So I, I kind of knew some of the guys or knew of them. So, um, and there's more, uh, there's a bunch of Minnesota guys there too, right? Well, and then, yeah, you got obviously Benny, Hank, and then you had Mike Peluso who was just, like I said, he was phenomenal to me. And Tom Chorsky was there. Um, yeah, it, it was just, it, it made it easy. And the guy that was just great, too, and he was a younger guy. He was even younger than me, but he obviously already a damn good player in the league, was Scott Niedemeyer. I mean, he was just, he was an awesome guy. And um, our uh, goalie, too, uh, backup goalie at the time to Berdur was uh, Chris Terreri and T-Bone, we called him. And he was just awesome because everyone had to be in the hotel for a sh brief, you know, a day or two. Right. You know, even the returners. So it was kind of nice, you know, meeting all these guys. And then we had our physicals. And then the next day we went in and we were on the ice. And it just I, I actually I it was kind of good for me because I didn't have to think about much because it happened so quick. And we had a couple of I don't know, did a couple of drills and then it was right into inner squad. And. I remember Jacques Lemaire was the coach and he was kind of an intimidating guy for me anyway, only in that his English wasn't great, but it wasn't bad. It was very direct. So he called the, you know, the boards was called the wood, <laughs> you know, you throw the puck off the wood, you go here and that's it. <laughs> you know, basically. I mean, he, he was very cut and dry and, and it actually was, I look back on it, uh, and it was great. He wasn't reinventing the wheel, but he was very defensive conscious, obviously. Um, but he, everything was five feet. He'd always say, hey, you're five feet this way, you're five feet that way, and it's five feet. You know, it didn't make a lot of sense to me at the time because I was kind of, I always, you know, ran around, you know, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing uh, half the time. But um, so he was great and just, you know, he was very to the point. And then our D, the D coach was a Hall of Famer, Larry Robinson, who just phenomenal player in his own right, won, you know, hundreds of cups, whatever. Um, but he was just an unbelievable person to everybody. And he was great. And he was very simple. And he was very, 
encouraging, if you will. And so we went through and we had uh, our practices or scrimmages or whatever we did, inner squad thing. And the best thing, and you, you know this from your playing days, Jacques Lemaire, day one at training camp, said there'll be no fighting. Okay. Yeah, well, that takes the stress out of it. Well, yeah, a little bit, you know. And and we're all tough in college, right? When we got a mask on and everything. <laughs> and then you realize what tough is. And you see some of these guys. So Jacques gets done saying that. We go out for our inner, you know, we're at, we have uh, the scrimmage, inner squad scrimmage or whatever we're doing. I mean, fights are breaking out left and right. <laughs> I mean, there, there had to be. Reed Simpson was a guy who was uh, mainly in the minors, um, you know, that year anyway. Great guy. I mean, he fought, like, and he's trying to make the team. So he's fighting Mike Peluso. He's fighting, you know, challenging everybody. And then, and then you, you learn pretty quick, okay, this is how he's going to make the team. You know, he's got to do this all the time. And it, it, was, uh, it was an eye-opener for me. But it was even more so because Jacques just got done. There'll be no fight. <laughs> and literally, there was probably, I think, that first day, uh, five fights break up. And it was just uh, so, you know, going on, going forward. Then uh, we had another, the next day, scrimmage, all this stuff. You And then uh, we had an exhibition game. The first exhibition game was in Philadelphia. And they always they posted who was going to play on the wall in the locker room. So I look over and that's when I saw my name on there. And I was like, oh, OK. And yeah, that's when it kind of really got real for me anyway. All of a sudden going to Philadelphia and playing there. And it was unbelievable. It was the, the old spectrum, as you know. Yeah. And they dressed you know, obviously Eric Lindros, they had, they had basically a full lineup and, you know, everyone had heard, I watched Lindros and heard everything about him and, and I, then getting on the ice with him, I couldn't believe how big he was. <laughs> they could move and do all this stuff. And we ended up playing and, you know, there's, it was a physical game. It was a uh, fights. There was everything. And we ended up winning the game and it was just, it was, and I got an assist and I was like the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> And it, it was just, it was a great experience. And you just realized, okay, this is a whole nother level. But the best part is, for me, I was like, this is the best hockey game ever I've been involved in. And it's preseason. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but the one thing I did realize, you know, going forward was, okay, it seems a lot easier. The wingers are always where they need to be. Guys get pucks out of the zone. Yes. You know, now you just, you know, do your best, win your battles and – whatever you can do, you know, and don't F it up. Right. And when you make a mistake, it's usually in the back of your net. <laughs> 100%. Yeah. yeah. And we were fortunate. We had, you know, obviously Brodeur who was, you know, is what he is a hall of famer, you know, one of the best goalies to play ever, but yeah. So it was nice, but it was also like, I remember my uh, partner first game, preseason game, Scott Stevens. Oh yes. My idol. Yeah. Mine too. And, you know, and then just, and Scotty was great to me. He wasn't a real vocal guy, but he did it all. And he didn't need to be because he did it all on the ice. He was so intense and everything. I mean, and even in that, a preseason game, like he was running guys hard. Yeah. <laughs> so Everybody knew when he was on the ice, put it that way. But he was really good with me, just simple, you know. Hey, we just go D to D and we move it up to those guys who make money. That's what you know <laughs> <he> say. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was it was a great experience. And then I ended up playing back then. And I, I can't remember. I think they still, I don't know if they play as many now, but I think for sure eight. I played nine straight exhibition games. And I was, to be quite honest, I was like almost spent at the end. So then I'm thinking, hey, I might make this team, but then I, I kind of looked around. I'm like, uh, you know, in college I was a, I could play on the power play. I wasn't a great power play guy, but I could play on it. But then I, I looked, we had uh, Bruce Driver, um, Niedermeyer, Tommy Abilene, you know, Scotty Stevens played a little bit on it too. I, I looked around and said, I'm not getting on that power play unit. Was Danica there? <laughs> and Danica was there and, and, yeah, Kenny Danico, who was just a character in his own right, just 
phenomenal. Yeah. Great guy. Just blue collar, just tough as nails, just, you know, stay at home defenseman, but just great in the locker room, stuck up for everybody. So I, I for me, I, I just kind of realized, okay, I got to get on that penalty kill. And so that's why I really kind of, you know, whenever you got a chance to kill and, and that, and, you know, in preseason, so Jacques playing all the young guys, you know, to give the older guys a rest. So we, you know, we're playing in every position and, and it, and it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, but after nine games, I was like, holy moly, like this is, and camp was winding down. And then we had the, um, it was a lockout actually that's in, in 94, 95. So everyone was going home, you know, all the NHL guys, and I wasn't one yet. And we went to, I ended up going to Albany, uh, was our minor league team. And it was awesome. We had a great team down there. A lot of college guys, a lot of, you know, obviously junior guys. And so we all got sent down and we had a blast and we had a great team and we had a great coach. And this is rare. You don't see this often. Our coach was Robbie Fatorek and he had no assistance. It was just Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> and we all came down and, and I'm thinking, oh, well, you know what? I played nine exhibition games. I feel like, hey, I'm I'm pretty close to being an NHL guy, if not one. And he straightened me out right away. We went down and we were practicing and we were playing. And I don't know if something he didn't like that I was doing. And he called me in and he said, you know, just talking and he was great. And he said, well, do you know where our East Coast League team is? <laughs> and I said, no, no, I don't even know. I didn't even know there was an East Coast League, to be quite <laughs> honest. And, and he said, well, it's in Roanoke, Virginia. And he goes, if you don't pick it up, that's exactly where you're going. Oh, man. <laughs> and message received. Yeah. And bam, and that, that, that's all it took, really. And I kind of like, I bear down, like practice. We had hard practices and we had, but the, the best part was you had a great group of guys. Everyone got along, even the French guys. Everyone was great. We had a weird guy, uh, Christophe Oliwa, who was a big, he was from Poland. Yeah. And he, he was tough, but like he was still learning the game and everything. And he was built like an Adonis. He was like six, five and like he could skate and everything. He couldn't think the game that great at that time. But he was figuring it out, and he'd fight everybody. But that like, back then, everybody. fighting, there was a designated tough guy on the team. Right. I heard that that guy, he would train, like, in some of the toughest areas in New Jersey at boxing-like places. Just, I mean, that that's what his deal was, was fighting, wasn't it? Yes, 100%. And, you know, and it took him a while. He was a little bit of an odd duck, you know, Considering, but everyone kind of got along with him. And he, you know, he was coming, he was from Poland, yeah. right? And he didn't know a lot, but he, he he was he was tough as nails. He trained hard and he cared about what was in his body. But I think Robbie actually, I think they the the organization really handled him well when you look back on it, because he ended up getting in games, you know, for New Jersey years later and stuff and being a part of um, you know, that. So they they were really good uh about developing their you know their guys yeah and that's one thing new jersey and they were known for that at the time and it was the, the group was great i think almost and we had a really good team and it was great and here's the best so robbie would run the forwards and the d he'd just come down and he'd say all right you guys are on your own you guys just roll it <laughs> and and he would and kevin dean who's the d coach of uh Chicago right now, a good friend of mine and brother-in-law to Benny Hankinson. Anyway, he he was our captain. And he wasn't the most skilled guy or anything, but he was just a great guy. Everyone liked him, and he was a good player. He was smart. Um, you know, didn't do anything particularly really well. He just did everything well, you know, like just smart. But he was he was he was good for all our guys. And we had guys like uh, Scott Pellerin was there. Um, we had a good leadership group. You know, we had a guy, Jordy Kinnear was my D partner and we called him champ. And he wasn't the biggest guy. He fought every guy every night. <laughs> like he, he would fight every night. 
And I'm like, champ. <laughs> and he'd have a black eye every day. Like, like I'd ask him, like, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. These guys all, I'm going to keep fighting them until they, they don't want to come in front of the net. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was great. And he was an Ontario guy. Um, just, he was, he was awesome. And I can't say enough about that organization. So fast forward now, the, the league uh, writes itself, the NHL, and myself and Cale Hulse, another defenseman, uh, who was tough in his own way, played a long time in the NHL as well. He, we both got called up along with Sergey Breland, young Russian guy who was really skilled. We got called up. The lockout ended. All you guys, all the NHL guys came back, and we were playing in Cornwall. I know you've been there. Mm-hmm. And it just, so we played there. We were on the bus back. Robbie Fatora comes back and tells Kale Hulse, myself, and Sir, you're brilliant. Hey, you guys got to go to New Jersey in the morning. You got to be there for 9 a.m. practice. 9 a.m. Like, it's a three-hour drive from Albany to New Jersey. And they're like, yeah, you got to be on. You're on the ice at 9. <laughs> so... The three of us get up, and I drove uh, Sergey, and Kale drove himself. And so we we get there, like it's I don't we left at like I don't know four thirty in the morning. Get down there, go go to the hotel, then go to the rink. All the guys are there, and they're all you know everyone's kind of happy to be back and everything. And we're just dog tired, and so we're on the ice at nine, and they completely bag us. And we're, and we're all the guys, and we're like, we're dying. Like we're the three worst guys out there by far. Yeah, you know, because everyone else wants to be out there, and we're just like, hey, we haven't really even slept yet. And we played last night in Cornwall, man. So, so Larry Robinson did say to us, he goes, so what? What were you guys doing last night? Were you guys out late or what? We're like, well, no, we we actually played. <laughs> and they're like, oh my god, we didn't even know. And like he goes, we would have gave you because we were doing two a days because we were on at nine. Then there was a workout, and then later, like at two or something like that, we were back on. Oh wow! And they're like, oh, we would have gave you the morning off had we known. And I'm like, well, whatever. <laughs> but back then, you don't say anything; you just do it, right? right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so then uh, it was a great year. Like uh, you know, I was up and down with New Jersey. So and here's how it would work. All of a sudden, for me anyway, and a lot of other guys, I stayed up. The season starts. uh, I watched the first five games, I think. And it was a shortened season. So we only played, I think, 48 games, I think. And so I'd set up and then be at the Meadowlands Arena. And all of a sudden, after the game, you know, I'd get a message, hey, go see Lou. I'd go up. Lou's office was at Meadowlands (laughs) Arena. So you go into Lou's office. He said, hey, we're going to get you into Albany. So drive to Albany. You're going to play tomorrow. And then after the game, just drive right back. So they wouldn't have to pay you? I don't know. Yeah, I never even thought about it, maybe. But I think it was too just to, you know, because I wasn't in the lineup up there. So we want you to play. I was a rookie. And it wasn't just me. It was a couple other guys, you know, here and there. And so I do that play and I love being in Albany believe it or not I mean you always want to be in the NHL but I just like the guys and I like the guys in New Jersey but it was a different mix you know there was a lot of, a lot of married guys older there wasn't a lot of single guys yeah if you will. yeah and so I'm going I'd have a blast in Albany and then I'd almost be after doing it a few times and I did it probably yeah nine times I think I counted wow <laughs> you know doing the back and forth and you kind of missed out because, like, there'd be, like, a Saturday night game, you know, and then all the guys were going to go out. And you wanted to go out with them, but, no, you had to get in your car and drive back right. to New Jersey <laughs> and stay in the – and I, I lived in that Turtle Brook Hotel, this just little – it was right across from our practice rink in West Orange. So, but being up – and then finally I started playing more with, with New Jersey. Kenny Danico had a knee injury, so it allowed me to play – and I got in there and I was playing kind of regular, still trying to figure it out. And Jacques Lemaire was great. I think I had played like, I don't know, 15 straight games. And 
he pulled me aside. We were in Tampa and he pulled me aside and he said, I just want you to know something. You have not made it yet. Wow. And he skated away. <laughs> I'm just like, perfect. You know, <laughs> like, and I'm like, uh, you know, and, and then three games later, and here's another great jock thing that he did. He would do this to guys, but it took me a long time to figure out. So we're, we're, I think we're playing Quebec at home. It's we were out for warmups and everything. And I did everything I've done every warm up since, you know, doing my thing, whatever. We're coming off the ice and he pulls me aside and he says, Yeah, you're not gonna play tonight. And I said, Oh, really? And he said, Yeah, I didn't like your warm up. <laughs> and I thought about it and I'm like, wait a minute, what did I do? <laughs> like my warm-up's been the same ever since. You know, I've never done anything different. And Larry Robinson later told me, he goes, oh, that's just Jock in his old Montreal ways, playing mind games with you. <laughs> he goes, you, you, you got to learn to understand that stuff. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, but, but you know, going forward, it was a great year. And then going back and forth, up and down with Albany and and in New Jersey, and it was great. But, you know, as the year went on, okay, we started getting like kind of on a run in New Jersey you know, and it was, you could see the team, like, it was really unbelievable when I look back on it, how a team all of a st- starts gelling, right? Like, you got a great goaltender, you got really good defensemen, and your forwards, there was no real superstar forward. You know, Stefan Riche was as skilled as anybody, but I wouldn't say, like, I mean, he, he, was, he was really good, like, but he showed you flashes. Right. And then uh, Claude Lemieux was just, you know, a shit disturber, you know, and but really good. Yeah. And it was just but no, like you didn't have a, you know, like like a Gretzky. You didn't have these guys like a 50 goal scorer or any of that, you know, going on. And then one night we're in Philadelphia and it's getting towards the, you know, playoffs are going to be coming up in like a month or so or whatever it is. And the deadline's coming. I'm in Philadelphia, and it's the first time I didn't have a roommate. And next thing I know, about one in the morning, door opens, and this guy's coming in. (laughs) It's freaking Neil Broughton. Oh, no. (laughs) We had traded Corey Millen to Dallas for Neil. And now, Neil, I have his poster on my wall at home, <laughs> like in my bedroom. Like, I was a big Neil Broughton fan, mainly because he's from Minnesota, all this stuff, Miracle, you name it. Anyway, so Neil Broughton joins the team, and I'm kind of driving him around because he doesn't have a car or anything. And and he played so well. Like, they plugged him in, first, uh, you know, top line, center, and if you know Neil, Neil's just very low maintenance. He just plays, yeah. you know, and I'm still in awe that I'm even in the same room with the guy, let alone driving him around. And, and he was just awesome. He was really good to me. And I actually, I said, Hey, Neil, you know, I'm from Minnesota. I went to Minnesota, you know, the university of Minnesota. He goes, Oh yeah, that's right. Huh? Okay. <laughs> he doesn't give a shit. Take a left here. <laughs> Yeah. He's like, yeah, awesome. And he's like, yeah, okay. Anywhere good to eat around here or something? You know, he was just, he he was awesome. And so, but back to our team and winning the Stanley Cup that year, he was a big, he was probably the biggest reason why we needed a first line center, play with Johnny McLean and um, I think uh, maybe Claude Lemieux. And they just took off. It was it was just like meant to be, but going forward, you sit and you know you look back on it. I for me, you see how these teams are built now, right? And to win a cup, I mean, we had probably the best fourth line, if you'd even call it a fourth line. Bobby Holik in center, who was just a man child in his own yeah. right. Randy McKay and Mike Peluso were aligned. And they were so, they called them the crash line. Oh, just big bodies. Big bodies, tough. Randy McKay, great teammate, tough as nails. You know, 
And he had some skill. And Mike Peluso had skill. Those guys would score big goals. And Bobby Olick had a lot of skill and a heavy stick. And he wasn't, uh, you know, going to fight anyone, but he'd run everybody over. Like, he didn't want to get hit by the guy. Yeah. I mean, he was just a monster. And then, you know, obviously we had our top line. And I think the other guy, and he'll hate uh, me saying this, but we traded Benny Hank and Alexander C-Mac to Tampa for Sean Chambers and Danton Cole. And Sean Chambers, he, his first two games – he was awful and <laughs> with New Jersey and, and they sat him out and he was just, he was not happy about it. And right. But good for him. All of a sudden he turned it around big time. And he was a big reason in the playoffs that, that we won, but it goes back to, you see how, what it takes. Like he, we had four good lines. We had, you know, our D core was great. Bruce driver was you know, awesome. He was the older guy. And then you had Scotty who could do everything and everyone was intimidated by him. And we played, uh, I think we started out, we played Boston, ended up going through Boston and I'm watching the whole time, but I, you're just seeing it and you're feeling it. And then we went on, we played Pittsburgh and, you know, they had Yager. I think, uh, Mario, Mario was out, um, I think he was dealing with Hodgkins or something like that at the time. So he wasn't there, but they were still a really good team. And then, and then eventually worked their way into Philadelphia. And quite honestly, those series were, they were hard, but I've never seen a team play so well. Yeah. Like New Jersey, it was just a machine. And then we get to, and this is a year on the West because we only played in the Eastern conference because of the lockout. So you only played the Eastern conference teams. So we didn't play any teams from the West. So Detroit, I think they lost 12 games that year. Maybe. Maybe 12 games. Mm -hmm. And they were the heads-up favorite to, you know, like we weren't even going to compete. And so we go to Detroit, and we win 2-1. Scott Niedemeyer came out as, yeah, I mean, he was just unbelievable. And, okay, no big deal. Even the papers are saying, yeah, time for the Wings to wake up a little bit. Well, then we win game two. Oh, in, in Detroit. In Detroit. Wow. Right? And they got Scotty Bowman. They got, I mean, they got, you know, Paul Coffey, Fedorov. They got, I mean, they're loaded. Yeah. And, and then we, uh, we win game three. And then game four, like, then it's like Detroit's like, Wait a minute, what what's going on? And then game uh, game four at home, we ended up uh, winning it. I mean, Neil Broughton had two goals that game. Sean Chambers had two goals. It was, I mean, it, uh, Detroit. I, they just didn't even know what hit them. It was just, it was unbelievable, and it was just one of the greatest feelings ever. And I probably didn't appreciate it as much one just because it was my first year, and I'm thinking, well, this is how it goes going to. Every year, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then next year, uh, and the worst was, so because of the lockout, we didn't get home till, I remember coming back from Minnesota or from New Jersey, and I got home July 5th. That And then they moved training camp up. So you got your a break. Yeah. So then training camp got moved up. So it was like September 1st was training camp. Wow. Hey, I'm going to interrupt you here because yeah. there's one thing that, um, you know, you don't think of. You think about cup runs and just the Stanley Cup playoffs. And myself as a player, I got to the second round. Uh, we lost to actually New Jersey. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you were there yet. Right. I have to look. But no, I don't think so. Uh, it was uh, lost there. So, you know, I got to experience what that felt like. Then when I retired, uh, I got hired by Ottawa to do some broadcasting stuff with them. I saw them uh, lose to New Jersey to go to the cup final. Uh, I think in, I think it was game seven. You guys were up like two or three games. Um, anyways, so I got to experience yeah. that. 
uh, which was a completely different level. Never got to experience the finals part of it, but you know, there, there's a group of players that are need to be on call and they need to, you know, stay in shape. And the, they're, they've been named, I don't know how the name came up, but the black aces, these are these extra yep. players. And I mean, your job is to stay in shape and you pretty much get bag skated all the time. So just tell, tell the listeners a little bit about what it's like to be one of those extra guys that doesn't get in, but just know that you have to, you have to be ready in case you get the tap. Right. And, and, and that was me. I was a black ace that year, uh, along with a few other guys. And, and, and the best part was, and what I felt, this is where coaching comes into, uh, Larry Robinson would always skate the black aces, right? And he'd come out and he would tell you in the best way, he'd say, hey, just be ready. You never know what's going to happen. He goes, and that's the playoffs. You just never know. Be ready. And he he was so uplifting and everything, and he made it kind of fun. But, yeah, you're right. We were getting bag skated. And after a while, you're just like, this sucks, you know. But you guys, become, a, you guys become like soulmates almost. Right, 100%, because it's all about, all right, we're going to go get bagged. Then what are we going to do? Because you're kind of away from the team, you know. Yeah. You're not really, like, you're you're not feeling totally part of it. And, but that's where Larry Robinson was very, really good. And I give him a lot of credit. He made us feel a part of it, you know, and, but it, but it's tough being a black ace is not easy no. <laughs> at all. Cause everyone, you know, and you, it, it's hard to stay positive because you're kind of like, well, you know, that guy sucked. Why can't I go in, you know, right. <laughs> or that guy didn't play, you know, whatever. And, and, and it's not easy, but, um, I guess being a rookie too, I bought into that. Like where, Hey, I wanted to play, but I knew where I was too, yeah. you know, and, and the guys are, were playing unbelievable. Yeah. So, you know, you look back, it's a fun ride, but it's, it's, it's tough. It's frustrating. Um, because all, Hey, at the end of the day, you're a player and you want to play and you want to be a part of it and see it. And, and, and I did feel a part of it, but not, you know, as much as I, I would have appreciated it as a player. Right. You know, so, you know, but I'm going to, I'm going to direct you a little bit because, uh, you love to talk. <laughs> it's I know, it's awesome. Much. We could do another episode because we haven't even got through your first year as a pro. So yeah, I know I'll go, I'll speed it no, up. No, no, no. I'm not saying that, but I just, you know, we're, it's, it's, what's interesting is that first year you, you said it that, oh, you win a Stanley cup. You think it's going to be easy. And then the next two years, you don't even get you get us you, the the next year I'm looking at your stats here the following year after you your first year your second year you didn't play at all in the NHL right yep and then the next year you played 44 games again in the minors but got uh 15 games in the NHL so you know did you after that year did you think that you were an NHL player and then all of a sudden you know what what what's going on yeah 100% so after that year Came back to Jersey, went to training camp. I was terrible. I wasn't in the best shape. Um, and that was all on me. But I thought I was an NHL player, you know, and I thought I deserved And I got sent down uh, during training camp, and I just pouted in my own head and was like, this is, you know, BS. I shouldn't be down here. I played in the NHL. I'm an NHL player. <laughs> and and it, it honestly, it carried over almost all year. I didn't, I was playing in Albany and I wasn't playing great. Didn't want to be there. You know, was that guy who's like telling my agent, hey, maybe uh, see if someone will trade for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which you realize like now it's like, what an idiot. You know, it, it's, you know, I just, I, I had a terrible year. And, and then, so I played the whole year in Albany that year and didn't play great at all. And then after the year and New Jersey had lost out, we lost the last day in New Jersey, the organization lost the last game of the year to Ottawa to get in the playoffs. Yay. Ottawa. Finally. Yay. <laughs> Ottawa. There you go. There's your Ottawa plug. So, so the whole organization is out. We lose in Albany. Like we had a great team. Our record was great. We lost to um, Cornwall, which was uh, 
Quebec's, or actually it was Colorado's farm team. And we lost in the first round to them, which we should have never done. So Lou Lemerel brought everybody up. We all got together and they just they bitched at everybody and blah, blah, blah. And I just couldn't wait for the year to be over, went home. And I just remember training differently, working hard, being a little more focused and just knowing I didn't want to have a year like that again. And it was mainly, it was just my mindset. I was terrible. Yeah. And I couldn't, you know, and I was just pouting because I, I felt like, you know, I should be there. And I, I wasn't, but it was because of me and how I was playing. And, and you know, so, but here's the, then the following year, I had a great camp. I still end up going down to Albany and, but my attitude's great. I, I was playing well. And next thing you know, I get a phone call from uh, Lou Lamarillo and he, <laughs> and his way of saying, Hey, you, he, he said to me exactly. He said, Chris, you've been a good soldier where we've just traded you to St. Louis. <laughs> and I was like, what? I wish really? you well. Really? Click. Yeah. And he goes, and here's the deal. You're going right to the NHL. You're not going to their minors. You're whatever. You're going right to the NHL. And I was like, wow. Okay. So again, you hop on a plane, you know, someone from St. Louis called me and says, Hey, we can get you on a flight in like two hours. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, she was with me in Albany and she had a job. She was working at the mall. <laughs> and I get a hold of her and I say, Hey, um, I just got traded. And she goes, okay, that's awesome. I'll be home around five. And I said, no, I got to get on a plane. She goes, well, what do I do? And I go, I really don't know. <laughs> but I got to go. I go, but I got a flight to, you know, whatever. So, it, everything ended up working out. She came back to Minnesota and I, I went to St. Louis and I just remember on the plane, like when we were landing in St. Louis, it just smelled like the Midwest for me. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Okay. Get to the hotel. I knew a couple of guys, Mike Peluso, believe it or not, was there again, which was great. So obviously I had that relationship. I can't remember how he ended up there, but, and Scott Pellerin was there too. So St. Louis and Jersey had some, you know, I don't know. They had been making deals. So I end up going in the locker room, you know, first day, you know, no Pelly and uh, Palouse and they're great. And kind of say hi to everybody. And my stall's right next to Chris Pronger's. And I'm in between Chris Pronger and Brett Hall. <laughs> and Brett Hall doesn't say a word to me for two weeks. Really? Literally two weeks. Wow. And all of a sudden, you know, we're playing. And Joe Quinville, they had just fired Keenan. So Joe Quinville came in. He was the coach. And he was great. And just said, hey, you know, just just play. Blah, blah. And they, they don't really know me at all. And nor should they. And two weeks in, Brett Hall comes out of the training room. He's got the program in his hand. And he says, hey, you're from Minnesota? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, why didn't you say so? He goes, I thought you were some <laughs> junior punk. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So then he, I mean, and Brett was great to me, like everyone. And I was fortunate. Uh, so I played like 15 games towards the end of the year with those guys. And it was, you know, fine. Uh, you know, played. I thought I was playing fine, but not getting a lot of ice. And we had Al McGinnis, Chris Pronger, um, Mark Bergevin, um, Igor Kravchuk was a, uh, you know, good defenseman. So fast forward, we're, uh, we're playing Detroit in the first round of the playoffs. And Joel Quinville, you know, we have a meeting and he just says to me, he goes, yeah, you're probably not going to play, you know, and just be ready. And I just said, sure. Okay. And, and we had a lot of older defensemen, Trent Yanni, a couple other guys. Um, can't remember exactly, but anyway, so I was a black ace to start with there too. And we win game one in Detroit and then game two, Igor Kravchuk just gets demolished and he can't play. And so I'm, there's like three other defensemen, you know, sitting out with me and I'm like, yeah, okay. It's not going to be me. Joe Quimbo walks up to me the next day of practice and he just says, you're playing tomorrow. Oh man. And I was like, Whoa. Right, right. And then, yeah. And I, I was nervous, excited all at the same time. And I ended up having just a, a great game for me. 
personally. And then, you know, I played the rest of the playoff series and we lost in game six. Um, and, and I was going into a contract year. So my contract was ending. Like it was up at the end of the year. Oh, perfect. And yeah. And so we ended up losing out and I really liked the guys in St. Louis. It was, it was, they were fun. It was a good group of guys. Um, and I went home after the season and right away, uh, Jeff Solomon called me and he just said, Hey, they're offering you a two year deal. And I said, well, what do you think? And he says, I think you take it now. <laughs> I said, perfect. And was that a one way? So then, you, know, you were on two way up until that point, right? No, here's how great Jeff Solomon was. When I signed out of college, what took so long, he got me a three year deal, which was pretty standard. But my first year was a two way. And then the next two years were one way. Oh, nice. Which, you know, didn't make me real popular with a lot of the young guys knowing that I was in Albany making, I think I was making 250 grand, yeah. you know, and guys were making 30 right? Yeah. back then. And for people that don't know, a, a two-way contract means that if you get sent to the minors, you make a certain amount of money. And if you are up in the NHL, you're making a considerable, a lot more, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah Correct. Correct. So, yeah. So then the summer was good and I really, uh, you know, I got a new contract. I got, you know, and it was a one way deal for two years and went back in St. Louis and I was excited to be down there and had a great year. It was, it was fun. We had a great team. We had a really, really good team. We had some pieces of the guy I became close with and still am. Um, we picked up that I didn't realize he was the mayor of St. Louis before I got there. Um, and he had been traded away. Keenan traded him to Hartford. Uh, Kelly Chase. Yeah. Boy, he's a legend. Who there. just pound for pound, probably the toughest guy yeah. in, in the NHL, just smart, but what a great team guy. You know, he was, he was just awesome. So we picked him up at the, um, I think Toronto put him cause he ended up signing in Toronto and then Toronto put him on waivers and we picked him up on, uh, opening night, I think, or the, day before the season started and we had a great group, good team. We started out hot and we played really, I mean, all year. And then we played uh, fast forward to the playoffs. And th- I had that feeling kind of like New Jersey where you're kind of only I'm playing now, you know, where you're seeing, all right, we kind of have everything here. Grant fear was our goaltender. You know, Chris Pronger was playing 30 minutes a night. You had Al McGinnis, um, who was just, you know, these guys were studs on the power play. We added Steve Duchesne, who was a stud defenseman, former Ottawa guy. Um, so there's your plug on Ottawa. Yeah. But, yeah, everything was going well. And we we get in the playoffs and we play L.A. the first round and we steamrolled them. Just absolutely steamrolled them. And the game four to win the series, we're down 3 nothing in L.A. And Jeff Cortnall's on our team. It was just an awesome guy. He, uh, Jamie Storr is a goalie for LA, young rookie, I think, or he was in his second year, but he was just playing out of his mind. And there's a timeout. Jeff Cortnell comes to the bench. He says, hey, dump it towards the goalie. I'm going to run him. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I think, I, I can't remember, I think it was Mark Bergeron dumps it in. Near the goalie, stores he comes out to play. Jeff Cortnall runs him. <laughs> and Sean O'Donnell jumps on top of Jeff Cortnall, beats the piss out of him, like, you know, while he's laying on the ice and there's a big melee. Somehow we get a five minute power play out of it. <laughs> we scored four power play goals in like two minutes. Oh, man. And we end up winning. And the worst part is, so we're in the hand, you're shaking hands. Well, Russ Cortnall is on LA. The LA Kings wouldn't even shake Jeff's hand. Oh man! <laughs> and then his brother comes through. He wouldn't shake his hand either. Oh, how great is that? <laughs> so yeah, so it was great, and I felt like okay. And then we ended up, um, we got. Uh, what did we end up? Yeah, and then we ended up playing Detroit again, and and they had our number. Detroit, yeah, we, we had a great series with them. That's when um, I don't know if you remember. Some I'm sure people do. When Pronger got hit in the chest with a, yes. a Lidstrom slap shot, and 
no one knew what happened. Like I was on the ice and all of a sudden I just, you know, I'm looking around for the puck, whatever. And Prong skates forward and just collapses. And his eyes went in the back of his head and everything. I've never been so scared in my life. I was like, what in the world is going on? And yeah, so that, that was a tough night there, but, to his credit, I mean, he got cleared and everything, and he came back and played the rest of the series. But, yeah, they had, uh, you know, Iserman and Shanahan and Farrell. I mean, they they were good. They were good. So we lost to those guys in, I think, six. And that was demoralizing because I was like, this was a team that could go all the way. Right. And Detroit was the guys, you know, that was the team that ended up winning it all that year. And I think <laughs> for two more years after that. But yeah, so it was good. But my time in St. Louis was great. I was there like four and a half years or whatever it was. And sure enough, my wife's pregnant and I get a, get pulled into Larry Plo's office, who was our GM. And he says, Hey, we just, uh, we're going to put you on waivers or uh, yeah. And I'm like, what? And then he, I went down to, I cleared and went down to Worcester and I was miserable. I was like, oh, my God. And Greg Gilbert was the uh, the coach down there, but he was great to me. He just said, hey, here's the deal. You can bitch and complain. I don't care. And he goes, if you don't do your job, play well here. He goes, I won't play you. And it was great. And, and I had learned a couple of lessons or whatever from uh, New Jersey and, you know, played well. And then like a week later, I got traded to Tampa. And, and the heartbreaking part was we were the number one team in the NHL at the time, St. Louis, and then go to Worcester or whatever. And then I get traded to Tampa, who's probably the second worst team in the league <laughs> in front of Atlanta and get down there. And, you know, weather's great. Everything is a, kind of a weird team. Steve Ludzik was a coach who was a little, little different and wore three piece suits and a fedora and two tone shoes. I just never seen anything like wow. it. And we weren't very good. Yeah. And, and then I end up fast forward there. I play there 10. And then all of a sudden Jeff Salma called me. He says, Hey, you're on waivers. And they said, Oh, really? And they, no one had told me. And then we, we played in Ottawa. Here's our Ottawa theme. And then after the game, he said, yeah, we're going to send you down to uh I think they were in Detroit the Detroit Vipers that was my IHL experience yeah and went there played there for uh, a bit and then I get a phone call and you're traded to Atlanta holy cow so I went to Atlanta and it, this was like right at the deadline and everything and Atlanta had already packed up shop it was their inaugural season um but it it was it was an experience it was fun and Andrew Burnett was there um, Ray Ferraro actually I was with him for two days and then he got dealt to actually St. Louis. So it was a whirlwind. And the whole time my wife's pregnant, she ends up having the baby in Tampa. And so I went from Atlanta back to Tampa for two days and then you're back at it. And it was, it was a crazy year. So I touched a lot of teams, a lot of leagues that year. That's crazy. And then, so it just seems like you're, you're just having a hard time finding your footing anywhere. Uh, you now end up uh, moving on to the Chicago Blackhawks and then the LA Kings for a little bit. Uh, anything yep. memorable on those? Any good stories for, from that experiences? Yeah. Chicago was great. Um, we signed there. And, you know, at that point I'm thinking, Hey, I'm, I'm done. You know, I don't, no one's going to want you and anything in Chicago called and signed there, played there at, our first year we were terrible, but great characters and Bobby Proberg um, was awesome to everybody, me included. Benny Hanks, uh, younger brother, Casey Hankins was there for a bit. And it was just, it, it, it was a fun team. We had fun group of guys. We weren't very good. Our coach was from Finland, Elpo Sohonen, who was a theater guy, which was interesting. And our practices were so bad. And, and not because of him, but he would, he didn't really know how to be mean or rough or, you know, uh, take charge. Yeah. Guys would be missing passes and he'd be standing there. Okay, guys, let's try to hit the tape this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of those. And then our next year, so Elpo ended up uh, 
getting let go. And then we they brought in Brian Sutter, who was just complete opposite. He's just a shit kicking Western Canadian. You know, everyone knows Brian. Like he, he was, he coached how we played, just passion and hard and just, you know, no nonsense. And, and, and we made the playoffs that year and ended up losing to St. Louis in the first round. And then, you know, that was it. And then uh, ended up signing in LA the last year. And it was, uh, it was great. And we weren't, we were good, but we weren't, uh, we had so many injuries, Adam Deadmarsh and uh, Jason Allison, our kind of our big guns were, were out. Ziggy Palfy was hurt. And so it was, it was kind of tough, but the one thing I remember about LA, it was awesome. My, now I got two kids and every day you wake up, the weather's the same. You're in a good mood. Yeah. <laughs> the only time you weren't in a good mood is when you were in the rink. Yeah. And then walking out, oh, it was great. So it, uh, I feel blessed. Like my family, my wife and I, you know, just all the places we got to live. Yeah. And an experience and everyone. Yeah. It was just a great time. So uh, we all have to deal with it at a player at some point in our life. Uh, how did it all come to an end for you? So it came to an end. I kind of, I, I still wanted to play, but not, I wasn't dying to play. Like I was in, after LA, um, the summer was dragging on and I was unsigned and I was okay with it to be quite honest. I was like, yeah, okay. And then Benny Hank, who's now in the age of business working with Jeff, you know, he was kind of handling my deals and stuff. And he called me and he says, Hey, the wild, you know, uh, want to offer you a contract. And I honestly, I did not want to sign with Minnesota because I, I was a guy, the bubble guy that always training camp was everything for me. Like I had to go in and prove I had to be there, you know, like I, to make the team. I never really went in thinking I had made the team ever, you know, like they had me slotted in, right. I had to prove in training camp and I didn't want my family around. I didn't want, I just wanted to focus on hockey and, and certainly training camp. And I thought being in Minnesota would be terrible just because now it's how I thought about it. Okay. My wife, I got, uh, and she was pregnant with our third and I'm like, God, this is going to be tough. You know, yeah. and I, I begrudgingly did it. And I signed and I went in camp and Jacques was a coach. So I had some familiarity with Jacques and he was great. And I just, every day was painful to go to the, to the rink for practice. And I just, I didn't like it. And then finally, I just, I, I told uh, Benny, he said, Hey, I don't, I don't think I want to do this. And I called, I was on the way to the rink and I called Doug Risebrow, who was a GM. And I said, Hey, can I meet with you and met with Doug and just kind of told him how I was feeling and everything. And he just, he was great. And I just said, Hey, I don't want to screw you. Cause you know, back then, and even now, you know, they got waivers coming up who, you know, whatever. And I just said, I just want to let you know, this is how I'm feeling. And he said, take some time, just go and take a week or so and, and think about what you want to do and everything. It was great. And you know how that goes <laughs> for me anyway, yeah. then I was just out golfing and, you know, having too many beers, it was kind of a relief to be quite honest, yeah. like the stress of it. Cause I always felt like training camp was a stress and it was getting worse and worse every year, Yeah, you know, where it was just, you know, it was eating at me. So that's where I made the decision to, to be done. And I, and I felt great about it, you know, but then halfway through the year, I was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know, did I do the right thing? <laughs> so you mentioned but, Ben Hankinson. Um, we all worked out together when he was still playing and, uh, yeah, he started working with Jeff Solomon, who was my agent. So he became my agent as well. Ben did. So when I did finally retire, he calls me and he says, is that true? And I'm like, yeah. He says, all right, well, great career. He says, you gotta do something for me right now. I'm like, what? He says, I want you to take all your clothes off and then go look at yourself in the mirror. And I said, well, well, why? And he says, because you'll never see that body again. <laughs> <laughs> he did. That is right. He said that to me oh. as well. <laughs> and he was right. Yeah. Oh, funny. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about uh, that tra the transition into being a non-hockey player. Uh, you know, how did you become a family advisor, player agent? Was it fairly soon after retiring? Well, I knew I wanted to be in hockey, right? 
at first it was scary. I didn't know what I was going to do. And then, um, but I, Carolina Hurricanes called me and asked me if I'd scout. And I was like, oh, okay, great. And, and Ben and I had been talking and saw and Jeff Solomon, you know, obviously they were working together as agents and they kind of wanted me to come on board with them, you know, to recruit, you know, players. And I didn't think I really had any interest in that. And so I ended up taking the scouting job with Carolina and I went out and scouted. Uh, the head guy came in, Burt Marshall, old guy, uh, who'd been played for the golden seals and the New Jersey, everything. This guy's been in the, been a GM player, everything in the league. He came in, we went and watched a couple of like three games, like during the Christmas tournaments here for high school. And we go and have a beer after. And he says, so what do you think? And I said, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm looking at. And he goes, at least you're honest. Yeah. There's guys that have been in this business for 30 years that still don't know what they're looking at. <laughs> and, and what happened, which was so great, and has helped me to this day, he kind of broke it down how they – every team does it differently. But Carolina had like five criteria, obviously the size, um, you know, skating – you know, whatever. And then he had two categories just for the intangibles. Like, you know, does he inspire you? Does he, you know, and we were talking about a particular player and, you know, that we had just watched a high school kid who I liked. And he says, well, why do you like him? And I said, well, I don't know. He's kind of doing what he wants out there. And this, and he goes, yeah, he's already a man. And he doesn't wear his equipment right. <laughs> and I go, what? <laughs> he goes, you know, how guys used to wear their, uh, their breezers or hockey pants, like they cut them open in the, you know, inside. inside. Yeah. yeah. He goes, how could you draft a guy like that? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know how to wear his equipment. So I was like, well, oh, okay. But then he'd said, but if you like him, you pound the table for him. He goes, it doesn't matter if I like him, you got to like him and he's got to inspire you. And, and, and he just talked about a lot of the intangibles that, kind of get overlooked, you know, unless you're probably a hockey guy, you know, does he get, win his puck battles? Does he win, you know, um, get pucks out? Does he shoot when he should, you know, even when he passes, does, you know, even if it doesn't work out, do you know the play he's trying to make, you know, all this different stuff went in. So it really helped me uh, a lot. And then I was still always in contact with Ben and Jeff and mainly Ben. And then I did that for a year. And of course, Stan, uh, Carolina that year, that was in 2006. Carolina wins the Stanley Cup. No way. Yeah. And so me, a little peon scout here in Minnesota, just watching high school kids, all of a sudden I get a thing in the mail. You know, it's a ring sizer. And I get a phone call. They're like, hey, when do you want the cup? I'm like, are you kidding? Holy cow. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, I got a ring. They gave me a ring, and I said, hey, I, I honestly, I felt uncomfortable. I was like, well, I don't, I mean, I didn't really do anything. And he goes, oh, yeah, no, this is our first cup. Everyone's getting it, and everyone, whatever. So I, I didn't I didn't take the cup. I told him to give it to somebody in the office or whatever, somebody who normally wouldn't get it, you know, for that day. And I told him, you know, I did take the ring, though, and I, <laughs> it was unbelievable. Um, it was, you know, it said scout on there and everything. It was pretty cool. It was actually nicer than the, the Stanley Cup ring that we got from New Jersey. <laughs> so I did that. And then going forward, um, I ended up uh, going with Ben on a couple of recruiting things up to North Dakota and watching how he operated and everything. And I thought, hey, all right, maybe I'll give this a try. So then I, I started working with him and then. Jeff Solomon, as you know, he ended up uh, taking a job with L.A. as their assistant GM um, and doing their contracts. So now it was just Ben and I, and it was, you know, the sports personnel services. And Octagon had approached him about coming on board. And that's with, you know, Brian Lawton. And Brian Lawton, you know, they had their own group, uh, Octagon, obviously. And he was planning on leaving to be a GM. So I think they were trying to fill that void. And then Ben was adamant about bringing me with, and we ended up joining Octagon. And it was, it was a nice transition. And two things like Ben and and Jeff and myself, we were a mom and pop shop and we prided ourselves in that. And then 
once we went to Octagon, now we'd seen it from that side too. There was a lot more resources and just kind of, uh, you know, they were part of the, they were a bigger firm that we used to bash, yeah. <laughs> you know, when we were, when we were the, the smaller group, but now, so we've seen it from both sides and, you know, with Octagon, it's been, it's been great. Like uh, Mike Liute, uh kind of oversees the hockey division at Octagon. And he's just, you know, he was a NHL all-star goalie, just a great guy. And he's just awesome to deal with. Um, when he was done, he ended up getting his law degree and working for the, you know, the NHLPA, yeah. the Players Association. And then he went out and started doing the agent stuff. So been doing that since. And it's uh, it's, it's been great. That's kind of been the transition, but it's been different. It's, a, you know, back then we were watching college and, you know, seniors in high school now you know, it's gotten so competitive that guys are watching peewees and bands yeah. and it's, it's tough, but I think that the, what's really helped me and Ben, you know, we were both players and, you know, not great players by any means. So we've seen the ups and the downs and, and talking to our clients because everyone's going to go through bad days and bad times and you can, you know, and you can relate to them on it and you can kind of give them your experience and it's kind of like our law degree, if you will. Yeah. Well, that this leads me into this question. You know, the hockey season is so unpredictable, emotional, and unforgiving, I guess, at times. Uh, yeah. And there's never been a winter that doesn't have challenges. Uh, and during those times, at least for myself, I'd start swimming in a pool of negativity, you know. And, you know, hearing your story, you had to go through a lot of that as well. What advice – can you give uh, players to manage their thoughts in a more productive, positive uh, way when things aren't going well? Well, the biggest thing that I learned was it's, it's not how you start the season. It's how you finish, right? It's a long season, like you said, but the biggest thing is it's, it's your attitude, you know, and, and it's just, Hey, we're all thinking about the place we want to be instead of where we're at. And if you can focus more on where you're at and being the best player you can be there, you know, it's going to serve you better. And it's just, you know, and I firmly believe that because we're all looking for other opportunities or if I was here, or I was there. Well, you got to, you got to focus on where you're at right now. Cause the only way, you know, you're going to, things are going to get better is if you play better. And most guys are always, you will play better wherever they're happy. They're the happiest, yeah. right? Well, sometimes, hey, you don't want to be where you are. You still, you, hey, you just got to, you know, find a way to be happy, be a good teammate and and do what you do. And, and it's contagious because it doesn't go unnoticed. We all think it does and it doesn't matter, but everybody's watching, you know, whether it's these, you know, high school kids, you know, uh, you know, college, everybody's always watching. And, and it, it's not easy to do at all. But it's, I think it's the, the most important thing is just getting in the right place and focus on where you're at instead of where you want to be. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that goes in the back of your head. Yeah, self-belief is such a big part of it. Um, yes. And it's, I guess, someone, I can't remember who told me, but they said, tell me about the best hockey experience you ever had. You know, and I, you know, say whatever it was. And they said, did that, like the first time the, it, when it happened, I mean, you just kept replaying that loop over and over in your head. Maybe it's scoring a hat trick or whatever. And then he said, but what, then what happens? Does it fade? I'm like, yeah. And okay. He says, the crappy stuff that you're going through right now, it'll fade too. And that's the hardest thing is that when you're in it, you just think that there's no way out. Your back's against the wall and, um, it's hard to get out of that cycle. And I find that talking with teammates a little bit, maybe, you know, someone else that is sitting out, Hey, how you, I, I'm just going like this and yeah, me too. And you know, that, that seemed to help, but the only way, uh, you know, for me in my experiences is that, you know, you just get to a certain point where you're sick of feeling that way and contributing to it. And like I said, just being stuck in that pool of negativity. So you just decide that I'm done with that and I'm going to be different. And that first day when you make that, you get to that point, maybe it's rock bottom, 
then uh, it starts improving. But it's definitely not easy getting through it when it's happening. No, it's it, it's it's the hardest thing in the world. But it's just it, it, it it's gradual. I mean, yeah, no, you, you nailed it on the head right there. And and the one thing I remember, you know, sitting out and like you said, teammates, you know, other guys, whether they're sitting out or guys are playing, they're like, oh, you know, hey, you're getting screwed or you should be in and blah blah blah. At the end of the day, guys, you know, and it's not a bad thing, but. Guys are just happy it's not them. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it, and it's easy because I was that guy. I'd, I'd say that to guys that if they were, you know, sitting out or whatever. And and someone told me a long time ago, and it always stuck with me. No one feels sorry for you. They're just happy it's not them. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make them a bad teammate or anything. And, and it's rightfully so. You know, so it's, it's – unfortunately, it is. You got to just – it's not easy – as you said, and we all know, because if it were, then, you know, a lot more people would, you know, we would be rich off of it. <laughs> but it's just finding, and I do think it comes down to just, you know, getting into the right mental space, which obviously is not easy. Yeah. Do um, you got a favorite quote that has stuck with you through the years? Well, I kind of said it. I, I like and I, I've kind of lived by it just because I've had really good experiences with it and bad, but mainly good is, and I said it earlier was it's not how you start the season. It's how you finish. And, and I'm a firm believer there because it's a long season, particularly the NHL. And there's a lot of ups and downs and everything, but you know, it, it, rarely is it always down, you know, you got to find a way to make it up. And that's, uh, you know, you play so many games as a pro. I mean, college is a little different, but youth, you, you usually get back on the horse pretty quick, either with a practice or a game. And um, and that's why it's a team sport. You know, if the whole team's, right. you know, struggling, then you're a band of brothers, you know, and I always remember veterans, you know, that were having a good year or, you know, had a, a good game and I didn't. Those, those ones that uh, recognize that, those were the, the true leaders on the team. Um, and that's, you know, that's something. Well, let's just quickly touch on that, and then I'm letting you go. You know, you were, you yeah. were a captain um, many times through your career. You know, what are some qualities that you, you know, feel are important to being a captain? I think uh, the biggest thing is you got to be supportive of everyone. You know, and you got to, if a guy's struggling, you know, you got to be the guy to go over and, and help him out. And if a guy's doing something, you know, you don't think is right or is helpful, you got to let him know that too. And I'm a big believer, like really everyone, we can all say it, being a good teammate. You know what? You should go out of your way to be a great teammate because I tell guys all the time, treat the young guys the way you'd want to be treated. Because I always, like, I coach in this high school elite league, and I tell guys all the time, you're going back. You guys are so-called the, the top players on your team. So remember how you were treated by older players. And if it was a good experience, great. You follow that up. If it was a bad experience, now you know what you didn't like. And and, it, and it's, it's effective. And I was fortunate. I never really had a uh, – all the teams I've played on, there's – I, I couldn't say there was one guy that I wouldn't probably have a beer with. Yeah. Everyone, I, I was fortunate. And our leaders, uh, you know, whether it was Scott Stevens in New Jersey, you know, Pronger, McGinnis, uh, Brett Hall, these guys, they all, they're, they were great. They were good leaders. Like in the, in the fact that they always, you know, had time for you, Yeah, you know, gave you a little nudge or whatever it was. So um, and I, it's always stuck with me. And I think being a, a, a good teammate and being a leader is it's not always, you know, on the ice. It's off the ice, too. Absolutely. Well, great advice. Um, just if there's one tagline or quote, it's not how you start the season. It's how you finish it, a man. Uh, thank you. This episode has come to an end, Mr. McAlpine. Uh, I first want to congratulate you on a fantastic career not an easy one no one ever has an easy one but when right. it's over and you look back you know it's something that you certainly can be proud of all of us are that uh you know have taken that journey 
not many of us get to experience what you did, winning a cup a couple times. And uh, the one story I liked, I loved, was that, uh, you know, they offered a day of the cup when you were scouting with Carolina and you gave it to someone else. So that's just the kind of human being you are. Uh, I'm grateful you took the time to share your story with me and the listener listeners. If there's any youth hockey players out there that are looking for someone to model yourself after, I think uh, this guy would be one, a good starting point for you. So Mac, thanks for being you and making the game of hockey so much better than when you found it. Continued success, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Peter. This was a blast. I appreciate it. I know that uh, the listeners there are going to love it. And until we meet again, my friend, you uh, have a great rest of your week and happy holidays. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Pitt. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed part two of Chris McAlpine's Hockey Journey and a journey it was. Earning everything he got, was grateful always along the way, and never gave up on himself, even when he got knocked down time and time again. If you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor. Make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.